for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This passage from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians is most often associated with weddings. If members of a television writer's room want to use some piece of scripture in a wedding scene, it's almost always going to be this portion of the letter to the Corinthians. But while this wonderful passage is most often read at truly joyous gatherings, It was written to a community that was anything but joyful. It was a community that was experiencing deep, deep conflict. Over the course of his letter to the Corinthians, St. Paul is attempting to help the church there overcome the many issues they're facing, and really it is a long list of issues that they're facing. One of these issues is a persistent argument over, essentially, who is the best Christian? Who is the most holy? Arguments arose over what gifts of the Spirit were the most important. Is prophecy more important than teaching? Or is speaking in tongues better than healing? How does does this ranking work? St. Paul addresses the conflict obliquely, using the metaphor of the body to illustrate the equality that we all share in Christ and the need that the church has for all sorts of gifts and various kinds of people. This morning's epistle sits between two chapters that address this issue directly. We've heard the first of those chapters over the last couple of weeks, and we don't get to hear the bit that follows on in the lectionary year this year. This chapter's placement between those two chapters that directly address the issue at hand makes chapter 13 seem almost like a mistake where it's sitting. It almost seems like a scribe was copying down the letter and his eye skipped over to the other column, copied that chapter out, and then just kept going. But it's not a mistake. Here in chapter 13, St. Paul reminds the church, not just the church in Corinth, but the church in all times and in all places, why we gather together, who we are. And St. Paul is not writing about love as some abstract feeling No, he's writing about God, who is, as he says at the very beginning of his letter, the source of our life in Christ Jesus. The love that St. Paul is describing is God revealed to us in Christ Jesus and present with us in our daily lives by the action of the Holy Spirit. It is not, not some action that we have to accomplish but something through which all of our gifts find meaning, find purpose, and find their ultimate fulfillment. We are not the actors here. It is God who acts. It is God who shows through God's very being what love is. It is God who is patient. God who is kind. God is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. God does not insist on God's own way, is not irritable or resentful. God does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. God bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. God never ends. God in Christ 
proved this truth to the world through his passion, his death, and his resurrection from the dead. God's giving of God's self to the world in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for the whole world is the ultimate expression and definitive example of what and who love is. That great love sanctifies all that we are. It allows us to put our gifts in service of that love. St. Paul's solution to the conflict in Corinth is to simply remind the church what the gifts of the Spirit are for. They are not from us, but are an outpouring of the love and power of God and God's love for us. And just as they are not something that arises from us, they are not ultimately for us. They are not given to us so that we might puff ourselves up and say how great we are, but so that we might put them in service of the love from which we've received them. So that we might show forth a little bit of that great gift we have been given to the world. They are given so that we might use them for the sake of the, that God who loved us even unto death. The love of God has redeemed, has remade the world. And by God's grace, we find ourselves able to play some small part in God's new creation. It is often difficult to see the world as already remade, already recreated through God's work on the cross. And it's been especially difficult to see over the last couple of years. But in truth, the world has already been remade by the God who knows and sees the world as it really is, in full, and responds with abundant love. And in the same way, we have already been made holy. We've already been saved and sanctified by the God who knows us, our faults and our virtues all the same. In fact, better than we know ourselves. St. Paul rightly observes that the new creation is something that we can only see in part, as he says, through a mirror, dimly. But one day we will see it fully. We will see the glory of God revealed and the love of God shining forth unshaded from every transformed face.